Somebody some time ago uh, dubbed me the father of public access, which is absolutely ridiculous. There was a whole group of people here, and I was just one of them, one of the people in the crowd. Media Mike's new documentary on filmmaker, professor, and public access TV pioneer George Stoney. You might work with George on a film, and then, as Suzanne says, think about him every day for the rest of your life because he had that kind of impact. The junkyard Democrats relax in the DFL Botanical Garden. When I'm in the garden, I like to relax among the herbs and browse through this album of artist L.K. Hansen's cartoons. As Shinabe people, we are at war again for our land. Considerations on oil pipelines, the fossil fuel industry, divestment, and climate change. Now on Democratic Visions, here's producer Jeff Strait. Too many of our electeds are behaving as if global warming were a, a, a game of badminton. Remember, it's the most conservative, recalcitrant, reluctant countries on earth, even the United States. If the world officially believes anything about climate change, it's that two degrees is too much. Time is running out. Patty O'Keefe is the coordinator for Minnesota 350's divestment program. Patty, welcome to Democratic Visions. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, what is the divestment program? Divestment is the opposite of investment. Um, divestment is a tactic that has been used over the last century to elicit social or political change around a given issue. The act of actually taking your money, taking your investments out of a company or a set of companies to elicit social or political change around an issue. In this case, it's the top 200 companies that have the most reserves worldwide in coal, oil, and natural gas. So we're talking about pipeline companies, mining companies, oil drilling companies, yep. things like this. So um, how does it work? In Minnesota, we're, we're asking folks to divest from the same list of companies that other people around the world are asking their decision makers to divest from, and that's the top 200 fossil fuel companies that have the most reserves in coal, oil, and natural gas that are, are on this list that an organization called Carbon Tracker has put together. Your Exxon Mobil's, Chevron, Shell, BP, to name a few. The fossil fuel industry at large is contributing over a third of our global greenhouse gas emissions, which is a driving force of worldwide climate change. But most of them are in And this is happening not only in Minnesota, but worldwide. Commerce University of Technology in Sweden, so. Yep, divestment is a, an issue that 350.org supports and is that it's working on. There have been many divestment movements in the past. Some of the more notable ones have been the, the divestment movement in the 1980s to uh, divest from companies doing business in South Africa in lieu of apartheid, from weapons, from big tobacco. Uh, I think that divestment has helped to catalyze a movement of people that really wants to connect the dots between uh, the impact that the fossil fuel industry is having on climate change and the impacts that we are seeing worldwide. I would imagine they're investing millions of dollars in lobbyists and propaganda to support their side. They contribute about $40,000 a day to lobbying uh, in Washington for the industry itself and then there's millions of dollars put into um, that's donated to think tanks uh, that helps to spur climate denial in ideologies. So there's actually been quite a bit of divestment activity in Minnesota. There's a lot of divestment activity across the United States. There are over 350 uh, campus campaigns as well. Divestment as, as a tactic campaigns. is very accessible. Really like Anyone or anything that invests um, is likely invested in fossil fuels if they're using traditional investment strategies. So we're seeing investment divestment campaigns in at colleges and universities and faith communities at municipal and state levels within foundations small businesses and so it's really been successful across a variety of different institutions but it really has become a an international movement 
If someone has a question about your program, uh, how can they contact you? You can either go to our website at www.mn350.org. You can also contact me directly at patty, P-A-T-T-Y, at mn350.org. I help to directly support fossil fuel divestment campaigns and can help give resources, answer questions. There's also a divestment team that exists within the Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light organization. And so I would probably redirect them, anyone who's working with a faith institution, to that team because they work to specifically support uh, folks in faith communities. Minnesota 350, of course, has other initiatives. Uh, what are they? Yeah, divestment is just one. We also work to stop the expansion of tar sands oil in Minnesota by pipeline and by rail. We also work to inspire people to be talking more about climate change in their daily conversations with friends and family. And we do quite a bit of work within the legislature promoting climate-friendly legislation. Message from the Senate, Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the adoption... Are there any bills we have to be worried about? Yes, there are. Uh, there's a bill, uh, House File 843, that's authored by Representative Pat Garofalo. Yeah. That bill looks to take away our greenhouse gas reduction goals as a state and also really got some of this uh, really great solar programming that um, has existed now in Minnesota for the last couple of years. Pray tell, why does Representative Garofalo want to have this done? It's a little confusing, actually, because Representative Garofalo did vote for the Next Generation Energy Act in 2007, which was uh, a, a bill that instated our greenhouse gas reduction goals. So he was in favor of that legislation, has since uh, joined a group called ALEC, which is a conservative think tank that has pretty much, we believe, has had a pretty strong hand in crafting some of this legislation. He believes that by passing this bill, we're going to be able to do more as a state for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which is ridiculous because he's trying to take away the actual goals and benchmarks that get us to that place, that get us to those reduction goals. House File 843, the Omnibus Employment and Economic Development Bill, passed the House on April 22nd and was sent to the DFL-dominated Senate for its consideration. The differences between the House and Senate versions of this bill will be worked out in a conference committee before it is returned for final passage and then reviewed and passed or possibly vetoed by Governor Dayton. What passing this bill would mean, it would mean a few different things. It would mean that there would be less funding for solar in the state of Minnesota. We would no longer have our greenhouse gas reduction goals as a state. It cuts funding for a study that looks at getting our state to 80% to 100% renewable energy within the next 30 years. And so it's really, really important that our legislators know that we're not in support of this bill and of this legislation. So uh, what can voters do? You can call your state legislators and tell them that they must take a strong stance against this legislation. The delivery of Bakken and crude oils through northern Minnesota via rail or pipeline has been an urgent concern of groups like Friends of the Headwaters and Honor the Earth, the Pollution Control Agency, and a number of Minnesota cities. Here's Tim O'Brien and State Senator John Marty in February. So tell me about uh, some of your environmental stance. What do you think about these pipelines that are uh, going to traverse the, the sea uh, across the state? Mm -hmm. up in Very Minnesota. concerned about the pipelines. They're not meant for Minnesota use. They're meant to that. go through Minnesota. Um, the, We're a transporter. Yes. The only thing I can say about the pipelines that's positive is rail transportation of oil is not a very safe thing, as we see the recent th incident in West Virginia, where the, even the newer rail car is exploding. It's a huge problem. I'm really pleased the Dayton administration's, um, the Pollution Control Agency actually stepped in and said, we've got to protect the wetlands, we've got to protect our natural areas here, we've got it, we can't do what, what Enbridge Pipeline Company wants to do, we've got to do it the right way if we're going to do this. And I'm, I'm really pleased they took a bold stand, the Pollution Control Agency in the past has never done things like that. I got, I got to say, if we're going to put pipelines, we got to make sure they're safe. We got to make sure they're not destroying the environment. Huge issue. 
The proposed new Sandpiper Pipeline is still being considered by the State Public Utilities Commission. For the project to move forward, that panel would have to issue a certificate of need, but will do so only if it determines that the project is in the best interest of society as a whole, and if no other reasonable alternative can be found. As Shinabe people, we are at war again for our land. And when we say our land, we don't mean ownership of land. We mean that that lake that rice is part of us. Anishinaabe peoples oppose any pipelines that pass through their areas. They have said so repeatedly with clarity and high merit. Like many of you, many people up here do not even know about the pipeline to start with. And then besides not knowing about the pipeline, there's a lot of mystery as to what is in the Bakken oil. Winona Leduc is executive director of Honor the Earth. And what we know is that you can live without oil, but you cannot live without water. The Environmental and Justice Movement produced this video statement. We were instructed in our migration story to go to the place where the food grows on the waters. It's our most sacred food, first food eaten, and usually the last food served to the elderly. It was served at our feasts and ceremonies. Where there is wild rice and manomen, there are Anishinaabeg people. We were told, protect it with your life. Our whole livelihood is in jeopardy. It's our survival, the very thing that carries us through throughout the year. One of the few things that we eat at every season, every moment of our lives, we eat rice. And then we gather it again to do it again. Because if that rice dies, we will die. It's our responsibility to protect that. I stand with honor to the earth. Uh, this show, Democratic Visions, is a public access cable TV show. It is produced by volunteers in the cable access studio. This one is operated by the city of Bloomington. Our program is carried on the public access channels of, of four regional cable systems. Hundreds of citizen producers in Minnesota use these friendly and supporting facilities. Thousands do the same nationwide. My colleague Mike Hazard has just completed a documentary on George Stone. Extras, what should it go back to? George was a celebrated filmmaker and one of the fathers of public access television. Mike calls his new film, The Happy Collaborator. Somebody, some time ago, uh, dubbed me the father of public access, which is absolutely ridiculous. There was a whole group of people here, and I was just one of them, one of the people in the crowd. George Stoney came to the Twin Cities in 1981, and uh, I was learning about video and how to uh, use video, and. He came to town to help us learn how to uh, negotiate better contracts for public access with the cable franchising that was going on. And I just fell in love with the guy. Last fall in the, in the session of documentary tradition. Come around 1999, when uh, NYU was trying to retire George for the first time, he had a film festival of works by his students as well as of works of his own, and he invited me to uh, go out to New York and show uh, my work in progress edit of uh, Eugene McCarthy. And I'd take our tanks and bulldozers out of the line to the water buffalo. I'd I hadn't seen George between 81 and 99, but seeing him then in, in 99, I just uh, decided that I wanted to invite myself into his life and make a film about him. And so I asked him, I said, George, is anyone making a film about you? And he said no, uh, which was not true, it turned out. Um, and I said, well, I'd like to try myself if, if you're willing. And he said, Mike, I don't know why, and I don't know why not. And that was just enough of a green light to uh, zoom in on George's life. 
keeping up with George was a, uh, a challenge because he, he got up, he would exercise for half an hour, and then he would be on the run for the rest of the day, right into, you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, going to films, meeting with people on various boards, teaching a full load until he was uh, 96. He was working on three films when he passed away, as well as teaching a full load at NYU, as well as being on the board at Manhattan Neighborhood Network, the cable, public cable access uh, center in, in New York. I always thought of George Stoney as first a teacher, as a documentary filmmaker, but also as a social activist who was concerned not just making documentary films to entertain, but documentary films that were going to make a difference. He's like a lighthouse, you know, he would shine the light and let us know how we could avoid some of the rocks and point to where we should go and I love him for continuing to shine the light. He's always bucking the system. He has this um, enduring curiosity. You just have to run with George. Disappears like the white rabbit. The stuff that's not in the film always bugs me because you know, you immerse yourself in the life of your subject and then you learn a lot about it. And of course, in a, an hour-long show, you can't put a 96-year-old man's life and life work into it. Um, but I, I, one of my dream interviews, which I was unable to uh, do, was to interview Martin Scorsese and ask him uh, what it was like to be fired by George, which he was when he was a student at NYU. And uh, in the film, you do learn that George, uh, once upon a time, wished he would be a, a novelist like Thomas Wolfe. Um, but in the film, you don't learn that he, it was actually Thomas Wolfe's secretary. This morning, I turned in uh, that program about uh, Indians, Indian rights. George made films all over the world. George loved films, but he loved people more. And for George, it was always about when the lights go off, then what do you do? I showed a half hour film about organ donation. To act on the uh, experience that you've just had. Propaganda, spreading the faith, and with the hope that some results will come. I had a daughter who died at 42 and somebody now has her heart, somebody else has her eyes, somebody has her kidneys. I can't, I can't tell you what that means. Well, we have the organ donation pamphlets here. Judy, you want to explain how they handle this? And of course, the immediate response is, that's our propaganda. <laughs> but I passed out uh, organ donation cards, told them about Cashel, and I got most of the class to sign up. Uh -huh. I said, that's the way media ought to be used. Combination of testimonial, personal intervention, and viewing. Future screenings and more details about The Happy Collaborator George Stoney can be found at www.thecie.org. And the Democratic Visions channel on YouTube features more of Mike Hazard's thoughts on George Stoney. Um, it's the sort of thing George would do, you know, direct you to make a better show together. Now, before we go, I want you to know, as the current legislative session draws to an end, Republican and DFL lawmakers and their staffs become worn out and stressed. So too with we rank and file Democrats who track what's happening in St. Paul, go to local party conventions, and need to ready ourselves for the, uh, the next campaign season. I'm gonna aim Rome aimlessly, ugh. Oh. Yes, we regulars do need a break from time to time. From a few years back, here's Tim O'Brien and the Junkyard Democrats. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who? Our erstwhile rockers, the Junkyard Democrats, Norb, Tommy, and Doug, answered the question, who let the dogs out, and the Republicans panicked. Recently, our air guitar heroes followed up with yet another hit video, but by August, the Junkyard Democrats had burned out and retreated to the DFL Botanical Garden.
Amid the quiet beauty of this sanctuary, our boys refreshed themselves with contemplation and the written word. Welcome to the DFL's Botanical Gardens. My name's Doug Lind and I'm a junkyard Democrat. When I'm in the garden, I like to relax among the herbs and browse through the album of vintage You Don't Say Cartoons. They're in the Star Tribune on Mondays. Artist L.K. Hansen selects quotes from the famous and infamous past and present and nails them to the absurd. Hansen loves irony. Here's a quotation from a French poet and philosopher. The future, like everything else, is uh, not like it used to be. Well, you get the idea. Here's some more. Anybody has a right to evade taxes if he can get away with it. No citizen has a moral obligation to assist in maintaining the government. If Congress insists on making stupid mistakes and passing foolish laws, millionaires should not be condemned if they take advantage of them. So said J.P. Morgan, American financier and capitalist. Curiosity is insubordination in its purest form. Vladimir Nabokov. Well said. The heaviest restriction upon the freedom of public opinion is not the official censorship of the press, but the unofficial censorship by a press which exists not so much to express opinion as to manufacture it. Dorothy L. Sayers, British crime writer, and a news manufacturing press is a crime. Here's another one. I'm a catalyst for change. You can't be an outsider and be successful over 30 years without leaving a certain amount of scar tissue around the place. Rupert Murdoch, media mogul. Always acknowledge a fault frankly. This will throw those in authority off their guard and give you opportunity to commit more. Mark Twain. Yeah. Michelle Bachman. Oh Lord. I know that I'm a super patriot and that I have been anointed to be the president of our troubled, sinful country. Help me to do what needs to be done. The mistake a lot of politicians make is in forgetting they've been appointed and thinking they've been anointed. Mildred Pepper, wife of longtime member of Congress. I'm so proud to be Iowanese. So what if I left the state when I was 12? No one's more Iowanish than I am. When my pilgrim ancestors landed on the shores of Iowa, blah, 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 Brilliant and subtle? I don't think so, Pa. She's no Iowan, if you ask me. But you have to admit, Ma, she's got really strange nails, for sure. Gertrude Stein, the American writer who hosted many a literary salon in Paris during the 20s. You are brilliant and subtle if you come from Iowa and really strange. And you live as you live, and you are always well taken care of if you come from Iowa. You are welcome here as long as you're just like me. You betcha. During his stay at the DFL Botanical Garden, air guitar man Norbert Gurnus, an avid duck hunter, learned something about himself. He learned something without an email blast or another TV soundbite about the life political. You know, I just may become a vegan. Tommy Johnson, our other junkyard Democrat, spent his respite at the DFL Botanical Garden with its collection of rare dictionaries. He's a blogger and loves words. Did you know that the words race car, spelled backwards, still spells race car? And that the word eat is the only word in the English language that when you take the first letter and move it towards to the end, spells its own past tense, eight. Now, if you rearrange the letters in the phrase Tea Party Republicans, that's Tea Party Republicans, and add a few more letters, 
it spells shut up you freeloading, progress blocking, benefit grabbing, resource sucking, violent hypocrites and deal with the fact you nearly wrecked the country under Bush and our president is black. So get over it. Just an aside, always remember one thing. I don't care what it is, just try to remember one thing. Now, possums, that's all for now. We'll see you next time. Democratic Visions is independently crafted by volunteers, mostly Democrats, from Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. 